And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are continuing our, um, our class-centric um, delve into Heavens and Heresies. Last week we tackled the Barbarian, a class that is normally fairly simple. It is the get ma it is the get mad class, and in s and what we ended up getting out of it was a whole lot of us being very impressed by what we saw. On top of that, I mentioned that the barbarian looked like guts, at least in theme, that it felt like guts, just no armor for the no armored strongman. Tanner later comes to me and says. On second thought, you're right. They should be able to play Armored Barbarians. I changed the class so they can. I uh, I was flabbergasted and, of course, happy as all shit. Because <laughs> when, when does one guy in some ass corner of the internet's feedback actually affect the development of an entire class? Tanner, as always, thank you very much for staying in consistent contact with us, giving us feedback, listening to our feedback. Um, we're happy to help you and we're glad we can help you mm -hmm. because this, this is, this feels like what a developer should in some cases do. Obviously there's some feedback that if you have a specific view for your game, there's some feedback that you just can't, uh, can't actually take into account. You can say thanks for that, but that's not really good for my game. But goddamn, when the when the feedback's good enough that you want to change things, I'm happy that I can help. <laughs> now, with that in mind, we do ha we do have to um, we do have to put one bit of clarification that we ca that we kind of skipped over last week. And that is, that is the that is the matter of um, core ability requirements. You need you need to have the you need to have the um the, those particular abilities as your highest in order to qualify for the for that given class. Um, yeah. Because 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 of that kind of thing, it also means that I'm um, trying to do um, a general a general flat range across the board. Um, on one hand, you could probably qualify for any class. On the other hand, um, your bonuses aren't going to be as much. And given how, um, given how ability scores are preset, probably not a good idea anyways. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's very clear from the core ability requirements that we've seen thus far that, that there is a reason for them to be the core abilities in order to exceed as the class mm -hmm. to exemplify and represent that class to its fullest yeah now last the the um the vibe that the vibe last time with the bar with the barbarian is you took is we took a class that um normally did did um did um boosted defense as long as they weren't wearing armor and raging as their core things, because the barbarian is much like a lot of martial classes in D and D, is treated like Babby's first Babby's first character. I'd say the barbarian is even more egregious than the fighter or the feater. Um, but what we got instead out of that was a class that a class that is tanky, not because of its high defense, but because because of its high health and high and high ability to get temp health or reco or recover health. And it's more about it's more about outlasting everybody than than anything else. Tenacity over fortitude, essentially. Mm -hmm. You you just don't give up. And again, that's why I said the entire class, without any of the additional subclasses, felt like guts. The quintessential. I can outflight outfight you not because I'm better, but because I'm too stubborn to fucking die. You'll die first. 
Breaking news, local man literally too angry to die. <laughs> that uh, that describes so many characters that I resonate with on a personal level. Um, I feel personally attacked here. <laughs> but if team. I'm the barbarian, uh, this week's class is, is uh, our illustrious host himself. <laughs> now I feel attacked. But yes, this Turn week we're tackling the Disciple, which... For all intents and purposes, the Disciple is Heavens and Heresy's answer to the Monk. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but neither was the Barbarian from last week. Um, and this is this is where I, this is where I have to I have to bring up the um co the core. Now, the Monk is a fa is a fairly popular class. I'd say a lot of it is d is due to the theme of people wanting to do the whole kung fu thing. But there's but there's also the there's also the fact that um them being able to substitute dex for strength when making attack and damage rolls which um as we've established in the past dex in d and d is basically a god stat considering all the things it's used all the things it's used for it's been a trope since i want to say white box mm -hmm. and the and there's and there's the there's the whole thing there's the whole thing with un with um with unarmed strike fo unarmed strike follow ups um and and th a lot of the a lot of the iconic stuff as well as um introducing key introducing key as their own little mana but not quite kind of thing mm -hmm. um, and. But the th the thing is, the thing is with the monk, although although um although it's stated that mad mad or multiple ability dependency is no longer an issue for monks in five e, um in a way it kind of is because you do because you do have you do have to balance you do have to balance multiple um multiple abil multiple ability scores to one be able to hit things two. Not be squ not be a squishy boy, and three, um, be able to actually have a decent reserve of key. It's not in as it's not as egregious as the third edition monk, but it is still there. Yeah, in in five e, uh, you definitely have to have at least one of the two combat uh, stats, strength or dex, as a, a an ability score you're dependent on. And dex is again because god stat usually better, mm -hmm. and then the other is wisdom, for all your monkey stuff. Yeah, and of course, of course, and pro I'd say I'd say those two as well as con because for for the most part you're gonna be you're gonna be in close, meaning you're gonna be taking hits. Yeah, but con's been an ability dependency since third. For every class, there's no way you can take a class in early levels without a, a focus in con. Now, if you're starting mid to late game, maybe then you could you could choose not to use con on some of the casters. But even in early game, you have to have con on your casters. Oh, uh, now and that bring, and we because because of all because of all that, um, I can see why the monk is is a fairly popular class to pick for a lot of people. At the same at the same time, you do you do still have that. One size fits all version of version of martial arts, which yeah. is some, which is something that I've I've never been a huge fan of, because yes, I get I get it. the mo The monk is supposed to be the living embodiment of I know kung fu, but as I stated when we did the reconstructing D and D classes episode of Geek Watch, the answer that I have to I know kung fu is which ones. <laughs> Ah uh, yes, when everybody just thought kung fu was a catch-all term. Well, the the big pro the big problem is if if we want to really get pedantic, the the term kung fu doesn't even have to tie to martial arts. It means hard work. It's all that's all it means, people. All it means is hard work. <laughs> so um, would it be so would be would it be fair to say that any, that everybody on um. Everybody on Tumblr and a lot of people on Twitter can never learn kung fu. 
Now, now, monk, that was low-hanging fruit. You could have gone for something more esoteric, like everyone on DeviantArt. <laughs> no, Except no, for a I'm small, gonna, small no, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go even more esoteric. Everyone on Fur Affinity. <laughs> Except for, as Sturgeon, Sturgeon's Law must imply, about 10% of them. Yes. Um, but yes, that does imply that so many people on so many of these sites will never know Kung Fu. I don't know, have you heard, have you heard the Rees? Just saying. But, <laughs> get, getting, back, getting back on the rails. The reason why, the reason why I, bring, I bring up that kind of thing in this and um. I want to make I want to make clear that this whole one size fits all attitude of martial arts goes all goes all the way back to the fact that um um Gygax and Ar Gygax Arneson and company were big fans of the um, Destroyer series of novels, which is where which is where one of the bigger inspirations for the monk comes from. <laughs> and obviously they were a couple of nerds, so and who the hell was gonna know that much about um. About com about combat sports in the seventies. I mean, when you th when you th I mean um, it would be it would be it would be quite a while before even pa before even um pancrase became a thing. Not pancreation, <clears throat> pancrase. Which, um, given that given you're familiar with the murder, Grandpa, you should be somewhat familiar with pancrase. Yes, yes, I am. Um, if you want a more detailed look in the er in the early days of com of the of mixed martial arts, I highly recommend watching the the um vi the video "Fighting in the Age of Loneliness," which was which was this lengthy documentary on the early days of the sport done by um Secret Base. Um, I think it's like two or three hours long, but. When it, but when it comes when we see a lot of martial arts characters in fic in fiction, they usually have a specific style that they're associated with, or even multiple styles in some cases. Yes. And because and because of that, trying to do, trying to do the one size fits all martial artist doesn't doesn't work as much anymore. And I I know I know that some people will say. Well, in Five E, you could take certain you could take certain feats or, or a certain subclass. That is a bandage, not a fix. Mm -hmm. But that brings us to the disciple. And, and uh, as always, I like le reading these blurbs he read he leaves us because so far they've been interesting. Each one. All right, let's go, let's go with this one. Okay. A Grandmaster once told me to view my weapon as an extension of my own body. I was never much for my studies, but this particular exercise amused me, since it was not, as most might think, an exercise in physicality, but instead one in consciousness. In my mind, in order to complete the task, one must extend one's own consciousness into an object in order to effectively control that object. So much fun! This task proves that consciousness is fluid. Now, what happens when you drop the object? An arm, once severed, ceases to function. But a weapon is not an arm, and the exercise is to extend and manipulate one's mind. Can one, theoretically, leave an inkling of one's consciousness, or of one's conscious mind, in an object? Can one then, through the extension of their conscious mind, manipulate the object? Better yet, is it possible to implant one's consciousness like a seed, to grow it from a small fragment into something more? Can one take that seed and reconstitute it with the self and thus expand one's state of being exponentially? Is the me you speak with now me, or merely a fragment of the consciousness I have left within this body? Does my true consciousness lie elsewhere? Finian Halfstep, quarterling disciple of the Laughing Monkey. Sounds like he's been to the Shrine of the Silver Monkey too many times. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> oh. But, uh, I... I like that blurb because it implies to me psionics without psionics. That's true. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to see what the laughing monkey uh, archetype stuff is now. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> As a side note, 
uh, viewers, I go into every one of these documents completely blind so I can be pleasantly surprised or unpleasantly disappointed, as in the case of Level Up 5e. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about Level Up 5e, we're talking about Heavens and Heresies, and I am always on board with this one so far. Yep. So, the core, the core abilities and the that that are going to that are going to be central are either strength or dexterity and intuition. And it says when you make a skill or spell attack, you use your intuition modifier for that attack. Much in, and it is possible that we're get, that we're going to be seeing a pet we're going to be seeing a pattern, but then we get then we get into proficiencies. You have simple proficiency in four weapon types, so you're not just stuck with unarmed or quote unquote monk weapons, which I always found to be kind of finicky for the same reason I find this feat is a fighter bonus feat um, to be finicky. Um, you're proficient in your intuition defense, strength defense, and dexterity defense. Not too, not too. So fair. that's so that's that's strength defense and dexterity defense. Even if you only have one of the two core ability requirements between strength and dexterity. Nice. You're proficient in two of the following skills: athletics, history, investigation, and skullduggery. Skullduggery. What? I mean, ninja. Okay, never mind. N n ninja monk would would work here. Okay. Um, and can learn two additional languages of your choice. As a disciple, you have a number of vitality equal to half your level plus your intuition mod. In addition, you recover additional vitality equal to your in in intuition mod whenever you push forward. Then we get to the death flag. When a disciple raises the death flag, they are instantly restored to full HP. Their movement increases by 15 feet. They may gain the benefit of all of three of their stances simultaneously each round, and may assume the same stance multiple rounds in a row. And they gain an additional action and reaction each round. I again, this is another clarification issue for me, mm -hmm. because saying they gain an additional action and reaction each round, to me sounds like that's they have an additional action reaction on top of what they already have per round. But yeah. a rules lawyer could once again go through here and say, well, that just means I get an, a, another action and reaction each round until I've built up like. 11 actions and reactions 10 rounds down the road N no no i'm i'm almost sure it's just oh you have one more than what you usually do per round here in combat mm -hmm. let's see so then then we get to the features so you and well they're starting gear first uh yes. two weapons of your choice mm -hmm. an adventuring kit of your choice and a tier one rejuvenation potion mm -hmm. and interesting you you have to pick your archetype right out of the gate. Well, that implies to me that these features, unlike with the Barbarian, which added flavor, mm -hmm. these are baked in in such a fashion to decide how your monk is going to play from the get-go. Which, I'd, and say, that, I'd say this is pretty unheard of, because... Um, I like it. Yeah, well, I've joked about how you needed how in Five E you needed to have your subclass in order to actually be interesting, but even but even within that, most of the, most of the time you um I think with only I think with only rare with rare exceptions, you um you ended up gaining your subclass at third level. You rarely ha I don't think there were any I don't think there were any classes where you had your subclass right out of the gate. You either got it at second or third level. I don't think so, but I think what's going for here is all monks are going to learn the same basics, mm -hmm. and that's what's going to be the outside of archetype uh, features. Um, with a barbarian, those basics were were carried all the way out into twentieth level, even without the archetype, and gave it a lot of its tenacity that to to show that the key focus of a barbarian is to be tenacious, and then you can flavor that tenacity with one of the archetypes. I'm seeing an opposite effect here. That each that, that your monk is going to be unique from the get-go in some fashion, and then it gets the generic tools a monk needs as part of being its specific archetype and also uh, having just the general features. 
So the archetypes are going to be what differentiates you from other disciples, but the 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 stuff that's general features feel like just the basic this is what every martial arts bases things around sort of thing. This is tr this is trying to do uh, exactly what we just made a point about with kung fu. I know kung fu, which type? Well, choose your type, level 1. Mm -hmm. I know Shaolin kung fu, specifically southern Shaolin kung fu. Okay, there you go. Run with it. <laughs> And it, so it looks like you get the Disciple features at 3rd, 7th, 11th, 14th, and 18th, mm -hmm. which is quite a few more uh, tiers than were in the Barbarian, uh, because it does start at first level. Yep. Let's see. Then beyond that, you have Unarmored. While you're not wearing any armor or a shield, your intuition grants you bonus hit points equal to half your level, rounded up, times your intuition modifier um so you can go in either with temp hits or bonus hit points or you can choose to wear armor and a shield and all you lose are bonus hit points you don't get gimped mm -hmm. this is avoiding pay not to suck yeah especially since um the ad especially since the i think this is i think this is also a lot Allowing characters to not fall into the um, to the lightly to the cloth armored only stereotype of the monk. So if they if they want to have a monastic order that is that is full that is fully armored, um, they can do it without having to deal with too much issue. There's still yeah. drawback. There's still gonna be drawbacks, but can you just imagine the the insan the insanity of a of a monastic order that tr that um has specialized full plate that they're that they're built to fight in. Yeah, I can. It's cool. Technology likes to give us the middle finger, eh, Monk? Yep. As to, as to uh, answer your question about a monastic order with a specialized suit of a uh, full plate, uh, I can imagine such a monastic order. Their name is the Knights Templar. <laughs> and that's the point where he went silent because of tech derp, but I thought that maybe he was internally cringing so hard that I had to make the Why are you booing me? I'm right! meme. <sighs> but yes, I can definitely imagine a monastic order with full plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just. Of course, I will, I will give you your props for not, for, for um, not go, for not going with the, not going with the obvious and saying, and saying that all I'm asking for is just, is just a bunch, is just a bunch of Makai knights. <laughs> Makai knights, or um, I mean. Everyone from Saint Seiya? A little more magical than most monk types, but still, they're they're basically monks in armor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, any, anyway, so second second level features, we start with deflect missiles. Of course, good old cla good old classic. You may use your reaction to deflect or catch the missile when you or an ally within five feet of you are hit with a ranged weapon attack. When you do so, the damage taken from the attack is reduced by 1d10 plus your intuition modifier plus your disciple level. Not much to say about that. It's standard fare. Yep, just with, and with the additional standard fare of uh, when you reduce the damage to zero, you can catch it and 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 if you have one hand open. Mm -hmm. and, and you can throw it as the same reaction. Yep. You make this attack with proficiency, regardless of your weapon proficiencies, and the missile deals 1d6 plus ability modifier damage. The, the same thing we've seen on the monk since at least third. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is it is one of those kung fu staples everybody likes, being able to catch an arrow or a shuriken or whatever out of the air and throw it back. Yeah. So um, it's, it's a good one to keep. Yeah. 
weapons special next is weapon specialization um, you gain one of the following feats you must still fulfill the requirements for the feat in order to choose it so we have axe mastery blade mastery crossbow mastery fell handed flail mastery polearm mastery bow mastery trapper and unarmed strike mastery so you can so once again you can be a monk who doesn't have to punch everything you can yeah, be a shooty you... monk crossbow monk I could imagine you dual wielding crossbows, Mildred. I wasn't even gonna go with that. I was gonna go. I was gonna go with the. Um, well, consider consider my temple. It's built on the side of a mountain. <laughs> what kind? What kind of? What kind of monks would that be? Per what kind of weapon styling would that be perfect for? Lots and lots of traps. <laughs> also, crossbows. That's why I said I could see you we dual wielding crossbows. I'm a monk, not a not a Diablo style demon hunter. No, I, I just, might no, as well... just no, just put no, just put up a bunch of people on a crow's nest and just have them sneeper. Sneeper, no sneeping. Yep. <laughs> oh, let's let's see. Then at third level, you while you're wearing no armor and not wielding any type of shield, your movement speed increases by five feet. This increases to 10 feet at 11th and 15 feet at 17th. Once again, st a staple feature, so not a whole lot to say about that. And we have of, of both body and mind. Whenever you miss with an attack on your turn and gain a, p and gain a point toward your combat focus, you can choose an ally within 30 feet of you to also gain a point toward their combat focus. I like this. So e even if you suck, you're still helping the team. Even if you suck and only do half damage. Oh wait, you're you're an unarmed monk. You're you're automatically dual wielding, so damage into half. <laughs> that's that's gonna. Be <laughs> I'm never not things. going to say that at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be one of those thi That's gonna be one of those things to examine. Um, at ninth level, you can choose two allies within sixty feet of you to also gain a point towards their combat focus. Um, I'd consider I consider wording that some, to make sure to make sure that the that the two of them um, don't stack. You know, to make it clear that no, that up until ninth level, you pick one ally within thirty feet. After that, you can choose two allies within sixty feet. Unless, of course, you want it to be three allies total, with one ally in thirty, and the last two within sixty. Keep it that way too. I don't care. At this yeah. point, I just love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, at fifth level, you gain. It says in the course in the course of a round, you may take either one extra one extra action or one extra reaction, but not both in the same round. And <laughs> I gotta bring up the dev note here. Yep, you read that right. A full extra action, which can be used to dash, attack, etc. Anything a normal action could be used on. They just get two of them. It's why I run multi-classing the way I do, which is described in the class introductions page, so I can give each class awesome features like this. Keep that note in the final version. Yeah, I would. I would suggest that you just leave this note here forever. Mm -hmm. Not even remove it at, at, once you go. Once you go gold, just just leave that. Yeah. <laughs> at fifth level, you also gain a bonus martial feat and an additional martial feat at eleventh and seventeenth. Um. At 6th level, you gain Legendary Resistance. If an attack were to hit you, you may choose to have it miss instead as long as it would not automatically hit you. Once you use this ability, you cannot use it again until you push forward or complete a rest. Um. And considering how often fights, or, well, encounters, excuse me, may or may not occur between rests or, or when you have to push forward, um, unlike our our problem with may not do again till short or long rest, um, this is actually much better paced. Mm -hmm. And then it, at at tenth level, this upgrades to you may choose to have the attack miss you even if it were to automatically hit, but not critically hit. And then at fifteenth. You may use this feature on an attack even if it were to critically hit. So at 15th level, once per per 
any in encounter between rests or push forwards, you can just say no, and you're and you're Neo at that point. No. <laughs> that attack, no, that one doesn't hit me. Fuck off. <laughs> but it's a critical. I don't care. Wait, now I'm th now I'm thinking of the eternal teleport behind you gag that was that was in a um four coma for Buso Rankin. Eh. Too slow, says you. Too slow, says you. Too slow, says you. Where the fuck are you going? <laughs> they just keep back they just keep appearing behind each other in one giant ass chain. It's great. I remember that. Um at tenth level this becomes legendary resistance plus you may choose to have the attack miss you even if it were to automatically hit, but not critically hit. And yep. at 15th level, you may use this feature on an attack even if it were to critically hit. Yep. Like I said, at 15th level, just once per encounter between rests. No, you're, you're Neo. You, you, you said fuck off. How much, of a dick, how much of a dick move would it be if you're using this against the B-Bag as, he, as, he, as he's preparing to... Um, to cast a power word death on you, or not power word death, power word kill on you, and um, automatically misses. I mean, that's exactly what I'd do. I'd troll the B-Bag with this. <laughs> Charges up, gigantic-ass uber attack, rolls a critical. He's like, ha I'm going to hit you. No, you don't. And, and, you, and, you just go, and you just go off and go, hey, dandy dick, you missed. He's got magic cards and magic hands. Anyway, um, <laughs> at 7th level, you gain Wind Walk. So, while falling, you may expend a Vitality in order to have you and any creature you are carrying gain immunity to falling damage until you land. So, Feather Fall, mm -hmm. by, by spending one Vitality, and it extends to creatures you're carrying. So, you can grab the party and go... We're jumping off this cliff to escape the explosion now. Bye! And um, at, thir at 13th level, you may move along vertical surfaces and across liquids on your turn without falling during the move. Oh, hey. It's, uh, it's Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. Um, or you Wusha. What, you want to know what, you want, you want know what makes this even more stupid? What's that? Um... Remember what I remember what I said about the whole arm about the whole armored monk thing? Yeah. <laughs> the Knights Templar walking on water and up up walls? That happened. They had the power of God and anime on their side. <laughs> Any anyway, at 11th level, you gain extra reaction. In the course of a round, you may take one additional reaction in addition to that granted at you at, at you on 5th um, level. At 17th level, in the course of a round, you can take one additional reaction in addition to the reactions you could already take in a round. And at 20th level, in the course of a round, you may take one additional reaction in addition to the reactions you could you could already take in that round. You may share these extra reactions with allies within 60 feet of you. What? Um, so that last that last bit. Let's back that up just a second. What? You can share all three of your additional reactions with the allies within 60 feet of you when you reach level 20? So, let, let me scroll back up. So you can get one additional reaction at 5th level. You gain another one at 11th. You gain another one at 17th. And then another one at 20th. So by 20th level, you have four potential extra reactions that you can, that you can dole out. That's not including the reaction that you're already going to get just because of the turn order. And not to mention the fifth the fifth level um, feature gives you the choice between an extra reaction or just an extra action. So it's e it, you either have so by twentieth level you either have three or four extra reactions that you can use yourself or dole out. That's uh. That's what the fuck. <laughs> I'm just gonna let my allies react. I ain't even gotta do shit. What? Okay. 
that's a that's a fucking cool capstone i'm not gonna lie it may just be a, ch a chain of features that go up to 20th but that's actually a really cool capstone i have four reactions and three party members we're all going to react to you and this is going to be like when any super sentai team crushes the b-bag <laughs> see then we get into archetypes <clears throat> And look, just looking at the first feature for the first archetype, yeah, this is get, this is where things are going to get crazy. Er. This party's starting to get crazy. Please don't, please don't hit the jukebox again. Jukebox. We're we're well past the age of jukeboxes, monk. I'm just gonna start playing Bury the Light right now. <laughs> <sighs> so first we have the Way of the Laughing Monkey when it comes to. Um, this, when it comes to disciple archetypes, as mentioned before, they must have they must have uh, visited the shrine of the silver monkey way too often. Mm -hmm. So, masters of trickery and mischief, those who follow the way of the laughing monkey are experts at illusion. Disciples in this archetype are able to make mirror images of themselves in order to aid allies and hinder their enemies. It's Son Goku. My comparison to Legend of the Hidden Temple was more apt. Than I thought. What the fuck? <laughs> that entire temple is full of pitfalls and illusions. Uh, okay. But I have yeah, to ask Tanner, was he thinking of Nickelodeon or Son Goku or both? That's a good question. The answer is yes. <laughs> Alright, first level feature. Juxtaposition. You are granted access to three different stances. Assuming a stance requires it requires you to utilize a quick action, zero feet, and the effects of the stance last until the beginning of your next turn, or approximately 10 seconds if you are not using the initiative order. You may not assume more than one stance in a turn, or assume the same stance two turns in a row. The benefits of your stance apply only to weapon attacks with which you are proficient. Wait a minute. Where, where have I heard this before? It's almost like flashback. You played Final Fantasy fourteen. <laughs> you also like Castlevania. <laughs> I'm pulling out all the stops tonight, apparently, Monk. Apparently. But uh, th this 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 very much feels like the stance changing system in in the in the base. Global cooldown combo of the monk from Final Fantasy XIV. Mm -hmm. I would I would bring up Thirteenth Age, but that's doing something similar but not the same. Still stance dancing. I love it. Mm -hmm. Um. So the first one is Doppelganger. When you assume this stance, you gain bonus damage to your attacks equal to your intuition modifier. In addition, when you enter the stance, and each time you hit a creature with a weapon attack while in the stance, you may spawn a doppelganger on a free action, on, sorry, on a free space within melee reach of you, or within five feet of that creature. Uh, alternatively, you may spawn a doppelganger where you currently stand and teleport yourself to a free space within melee reach of you, of you or f within five feet of the creature. This doppelganger is identical to you in every way, though it is an illusion and has only one hit point. Like you, it can be subject to conditions, though it takes no damage when weapon attacks fail to hit rather than half. You may speak, utilize items, features or items, or attack through your doppelganger, but you, but you yourself must spend the resources to do so. You cannot see through the doppelganger's eyes and must see a doppelganger to control it. The doppelganger doesn't does not set off traps reliant on weight, but can otherwise be detected. Any healing the doppelganger receives heals you instead, unless you both unless you would both be subjected to the same instance of healing multiple times, in which case only you are healed. Your actions, reactions, and movement are shared between you and your doppelgangers. Whenever you assume a stance, your doppelgangers assume the same stance. If a doppelganger travels more than 60 feet from you, it disappears. Doppelgangers last... For the duration of an encounter, or 30 seconds, if the character is not currently in an encounter. If a creature is attempting to distinguish between you and your doppelgangers, it makes an intuition investigation check against your intuition defense. So I plucked a hair from my head and made another me. Got it. 
and even more than that, this could this could probably involves this could involve some potential crazy um combos with the crossbow monk. <laughs> I shoot you, then te then teleport over you so I can kick your ass in up and close. And I leave my 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 uh doppelganger behind with a phantom crossbow. This also this also means you could eat you could easily make um flanks. Mm hmm Let's see. So um next next you have dis next you have um dispersion. Whenever you or one of your doppelgangers would take damage while in this stance, you may expend the vitality or it says add vitality, you might want to fix that, and utilize your reaction in order to switch Places before the damage is dealt. So <laughs> now, now it's even worse. So either you can uh, have you have a dop. Let, let's say you, we we're continue. Let, let's continue your crossbow monk example. You shot the guy. You teleported to him and left your doppelganger behind. It's now his turn. He swings at you before damage is dealt. You switch it through doppelganger, who only has one HP to begin with, and. Uh, probably disperses into nothingness. But now you're back in, at uh, crossbow range and ready to shoot him again and do it all over again. <laughs> That's just not fair. No. Um, then we have Phantom Rush. While in this stance, you no longer share a movement speed with your doppelgangers, and they gain a movement speed equal to your own. In addition, you may use your reaction on your turn in order to trade places with one of your doppelgangers while in this stance. So, are Dispersion and Phantom Rush the other two stances? Yes. Okay, I just want to, I think, I think that it needs to be made a little more clear. Mm -hmm. um, that these are also stances. Maybe they could just be tagged as stances or something along those lines. Pro that, that might work. So you move from doppelganger stance to dispersion stance, and then to phantom rush stance. But you don't you don't necessarily have to move in that order. I know, but I'm just saying that actually seems like the natural order to do things. Looking at this, <laughs> the only rule that you have is you can't be in the same stance for more for more than one round, and you can't do it twice in a row. Hmm. You can't do the same stance twice, so you have to you have to be able to do. One then another then another. You have you have to you have to stand you have to be playing footsies with stances. Yeah, stance um, dancing. You could just go doppelganger dispersion over and over and over if you really wanted to, mm -hmm. or doppelganger and phantom rush. Yep. So next at seventh level, you gain illusory existence. Once per turn is a free action, you may ex expend and vitality. Do I hear too? In order to gain a number of doppelgangers equal to your intuition modifier that follows what? the same rules as those listed in your doppelganger stance. Free action! Free action! Spend one vitality, spawn doppelgangers equal to int mod. And yes, that if you have a plus four int mod, four doppelgangers, go, I plucked four hairs. There's a reason that that that, that uh, Sun Wukong's ability was called the Unshackled Doppelganger. He could eventually sp spawn armies. At, at 14th level, you gain greater juxtaposition. Your stance is improved in the following ways. With Doppelganger, you may choose not to add your your intuition modifier as a damage onto your web onto your attack in order to spawn an additional Doppelganger when you enter the stance and hit an enemy with a weapon attack. So, so you forego, forego extra damage for extra doppelgangers. Yes. Let's see, dispersion. Whenever an ally within 30 feet of you or your doppelgangers takes damage, you can use your reaction and expend a vitality to have either yourself or one of your doppelgangers change places with that ally before damage is dealt. And Phantom Rush, your doppelgangers do not provoke attacks of opportunity unless you choose to have them do so. What the fuck? <laughs> and at 18th level, mischief. 
Whenever you assume a stance, you may expend a vitality and turn a number of creatures or doppelgangers equal to your intuition modifier within 30 feet of you invisible and making them hidden. You may expend additional vitality to affect more creatures. The severity of the condition is equal to your intuition modifier plus your proficiency modifier. This invisibility lasts for the encounter or lasts until the creature attacks, makes an ability check, or casts a spell. And your maximum vitality increases by an amount equal to your proficiency modifier. So we have, so you can bu you can build an army of doppelgangers and make them invisible. I give me the Ryu Tinkabong and call me Sun Wukong. We're going to war, boys. <laughs> So, next we the next one we have is the Way of the Shifting Beasts. There is knowledge to be gained from the beasts of the mortal plane. Delicateness, power, speed. All traits employed by the various fauna of Mirari. A disciple trained in the Way of the Shifting Beasts is able to, to embody the aspects of those creatures in order to defend themselves from harm. It's, it's, I just, I just looked at the first level feature and the names of the stances. It's Shaolin Kung Fu. Yep. First feature, animal forms. You're, again, you're granted access to five different stances. Assuming a stance re requires a quick action. Da, 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 da. We've, already go we've already gone over the rules with stances. So, tiger stance. When assuming the stance, you may bleed the creature, afflicting physical one. Physical one it. Whenever you I hit think it, the weapon. I think it means physical one on it. You need an on there. Yep. Um. Dragon or remo stance. removing it, you could just say afflicting physical one, yep. and leave it at that. Um, dragon stance. When you assume this stance, you may purge conditions from yourself as if you had chosen to fight defensively. Crane stance. Your movement speed increases by 10 feet, and you do not provoke attacks of opportunity when you leave an enemy's threatened area. Almost as if you're flying along the battlefield. Leopard stance. If you move at least 15 feet in a straight line while in this stance and then hit a creature with a weapon attack, you may also knock this creature prone if your attack roll would hit its strength defense. Your threat range against prone creatures increases by 2 while in this stance. Oh, knock them prone and then all of a sudden you're you're uh just on on account of having this stance, you uh you threaten their your your critical threat range becomes 17 to 20. Mm -hmm. Good job. Or no, 18 to 20, excuse me. Um, then Viper Stance. When you assume this stance, you may poison the creature. Uh, po poison one. Whenever, whenever you hit with a weapon attack. Once again, the s the same typo that we mentioned earlier. Mm hmm. So. So. Y this is this is a, uh, a like a a CC toolkit. This is almost a crowd control to toolkit. You've got stuff to afflict debuffs. Um, you've got stuff to purge debuffs from yourself. And then increases in speed or the ability to knock creatures prone and do better criticals against prone creatures. Mm -hmm. And it, it's all CC. It's, you are moving among the battlefield, afflicting people with bullshit. <laughs> and then going on to the next one, allowing your allies to come up and be like, oh... You have physical affliction. We heat you with steak even better, and you take more damage. Mm -hmm. um, at seventh level, you gain Chimera Stance. You may expend a vitality and utilize a quick action in order to gain the effects of two stances at the same time. You may not assume either of the two stances on your next turn. Wow, this means you could actually do the whole Shaolin... Uh, Shaolin um, proverb of the marriage of, tigen, of dragon and tiger is almost perfect. Mm -hmm. Not that that would help you much with the dragon stance unless you're afflicted with something really bad and you want to also hit somebody with afflicting physical. I would think of more doing tiger viper so you could do physical poison. Mm -hmm. Or crane leopard. Ooh, crane leopard. Ooh, crane leopard! That's gross! That's so gross! <laughs> Stop. All right. Let's see. At 14th level, you gain improved animal forms. 
which, bo which boosts all of your stances. For Tiger Stance, your threat range increases by 2 against afflicted creatures. For Dragon Stance, you gain temporary HP equal to your Intuition mod plus your Proficiency mod. For Crane Stance, attacks that would knock you prone or move you are made with disadvantage. For Leopard Stance, you have advantage on weapon attack rolls against a creature if at least one of your allies is within 5 feet of the creature and the ally isn't incapacitated. And Viper Stance, uh, um, creatures within your melee reach are vulnerable 1. What? Just the fact that I'm in the stance makes you vulnerable 1 when you're in my, my melee reach. What? You want to know what... <laughs> Um, imagine do imagine doing this with a weapon with reach. Uh-huh. Uh, pole arms. Pole arm mastery. Yep. This is gross. <laughs> I love it. It's fantastic. Let's see. Eighteenth level. Um, improved Chimera stands, and he decided to put in the flavor text Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. Of course he did. Um, <laughs> He's a man of culture. Yeah. And I, I. He had put he had put in an aside on the document that he know he knows he needs to change a lot of the flavor text, but in researching the class and and how it should operate, he watched probably forty to sixty hours of martial arts movies. Rookie. Uh huh. <laughs> like, man, I watched some of the original Jet Li stuff that never came to the U.S. And the Jackie Chan stuff, and a whole bunch That's, of others. You may utilize your Chimera stance feature without expending a vitality point, and may gain the effects of three stances at the same time, rather than two. Like if a Chimera. If you assume three stances at the same time, you may assume one of the three stances on your next turn, if you choose to, but may not assume that stance three turns in a row. So, I'd like to note that while there's no goat head... You could actually build two thirds of a chimera with dragon and viper. I, I would, if I, if I were going to do this at eighteenth level, my first chimera stance at around would probably be, um, tiger, dragon, viper. So I get the temporary hit points. Things are vulnerable, and I can immediately inflict both. <laughs> Poison and and affliction physical on things, and then the next turn would be tiger, crane, leopard, because now my threat range is increased, and I have the increased movement, and I have all the the leopard stance stuff. It's just, and then I guess my third my third uh third round would be crane, leopard, viper, because oh my god, oh crane, viper, dragon, excuse me, that's just and. Every time now the real question is every time you go into dragon stance you'd get temp hit points right yes so if you're rotating dragon stance out every so often uh you're you're getting a, a an almost permanent temp hit point shield i mean obviously at, at 14th level you're taking some pretty big hits so in int mod plus proficiency mod may not be a huge amount of temp hit points that can be potentially life-saving especially if you're refreshing it yeah let let me um let me take a look at what vulnerable is when it comes to i remember that that one i think increases critical threat range per level of the uh of the um affliction pretty sure yep how did i remember because it's utterly ridiculous and I love it. And it, it, it's, it's an inclusion to other things, too, if I remember. Yeah. Especially... Yeah, that... that so that, mean, that means that um, your threat range... Your threat range against prone creatures while in leopard stance is um is seventeen twenty. Eighteen twenty. Two two plus or uh 
two more because it starts at just 20 and then it goes two more down from that yeah and that um then remember and then vulnerable would would stack on that on top of that or if you're a tiger and you've just inflicted things with afflicted poison or afflicted physical one now your threat range is 1720 if in a tiger viper stance I, look, I look forward to seeing the broken ass crit fisher build that somebody can do with way of shifting beasts. There's going to be broken ass crit fishing and a lot of CC. Like I said, a lot of fucking CC. Which is in, which is interesting because usually when people usually when people um when people do a monk class in fantasy games, they're ver they're very much the, they're very much a um melee DPSer, focused mm -hmm. focused on focused on taking out one enemy. And then that's it, and then moving on to another enemy and focusing just on that enemy. Whereas this one has things that clearly increase increase uh, your ability against enemies, but it also opens up increased vulnerabilities that other people can take can take advantage of as well. Mm -hmm. Just being prone is something that you can take advantage of. So next we have the way of the drunken brawler. Oh. <laughs> For some, the drink is confusion, a hindrance to clarity. A disciple trained in the way of the drunken brawler finds neither confusion nor hindrance in the drink, but instead lucidity, enlightenment. They utilize the drink to match their, bo to match their body to the ebb and sway of the world's chaos, channeling it in order to defend themselves. Drunken Immortal time. Drunken Taoist Immortal. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. First feature, each is Endless Gourd. Each brawler is equipped with their own gourd as a symbol of their discipline and ability. You gain an additional personal effect, a gourd or flask or some other liquid container. Only you may drink from this vessel from this vessel, and only when in your ganbe stance. Otherwise... Gompe. Is... Yes. As in, as in the, the Chinese pronunciation of of the same thing we hear from Japan as kampai. Mm -hmm. It's it's cheers. Your cheers stance. <laughs> if That's lost, literally what this is. <laughs> if lost, the vessel is automatically summoned to you when you enter your gampai stance. Gampai! <laughs> <laughs> um, you may ignore all conditions gained as a result of being intoxicated, and you may always choose to attack with disadvantage while intoxicated. So, reading the intoxication mechanics, a creature can reasonably handle a number of drinks equal to their fortitude score. If a character consumes more than this, they become intoxicated. While intoxicated, a character suffers a number of conditions of the GM's choice, whose severity is equal to the number of the drinks a character has had, and attacks against them have advantage. Resting effectively reduces the number of drinks a character has consumed by an amount equal to their fortitude score. The effects of this condition exist until the effective number of drinks is once again below a character's fortitude score. So if you've drank uh, as many drinks as more than double your fortitude score, you have to sleep more than once. But in but if you're away of the jugged brawler, the GM gets to pick nothing! You get nothing! Good day, sir! So, next we, next we have Drunken Style. With you're, our gra you're granted access to three stances. So you have Drunken Strike, which you can only enter while you are in, when you are intoxicated. You, when you make a weapon attack at, disadv at disadvantage while in this stance, if any of the die rolls fall within your threat range, the attack is considered to critically hit. In addition, if either die falls below a 7, you may treat your roll as a 7 instead. The last, If the last stance you were in was Drunken Defense, you lose your intoxication at the beginning of your next turn. Then we have Drunken Defense. You may only enter in this stance while you are intoxicated. While you're in this stance, your deflection increases by an amount equal to your intuition modifier. If the last stance you were in with was Drunken Strike, you lose your intoxication at the beginning of your next turn. So this have... prevents you from doing more than two of the stances before having to return to Gumpe stance. Mm -hmm. Then Gumpe stance. When you assume this stance, you summon your Endless Gourd into your hand and are able to take a drink. 
intoxicating you. You may use this feature regardless of whether or not you have a free hand. A drunken brawler always finds a way to take a drink. In addition, when you enter this stance, you gain temporary hit points equal to your intuition modifier times two. Your stance dancing in drunken style is literally you going, I heard no bell, and taking a swig every so often. Um, <laughs> especially considering the fact that you, you can choose to roll at disadvantage while intoxicated, which plays into your drunken strike. Which means you can't roll below seven, and so you'll only fail if you roll one, uh, one through four. Mm -hmm. And... Well, unless, of course, a 7 or higher isn't enough to hit whatever you're hitting, but even then, that miss is still half damage. <clears throat> and if the die fall... Like, if you have an expanded threat range, which there are many ways to get one, so... And your die just falls within the threat range, it's an automatic crit. What? Okay. I love it. And then deflection increased by the amount equal to your int mod while you're in drunken defense. That's fantastic. So, dur so during battle, you're going to be going gump by and then uh, drunk, probably drunken strike next. And then gump by again and then probably drunken strike next. <laughs> Just to keep yourself drunk as hell. And then maybe if there's something coming your way, you're like, oh, that's no goody. Um, drunk at defense for deflection. And then back to Gompai. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> this is this is where we kind of deviate from that from that trit from that Trinity kind of circle. This is less of yeah. a Trinity and more of a um more branching a, duality. Yeah. You're trying to go All Go ahead. I was going to say, all of it stems from t saying cheers and taking a drink. Uh, I, I would... I, there, is a, there is a small part of me that, that is wondering, okay, if, okay, if we're, going if we're going with the... Um, if we're going with the... If we're going with... Since these are all weapon attacks and it doesn't necessitate melee... Um, the um dr the drunken sniper is still viable. <laughs> I hate that you're right. Is this an oversight, Tanner, or is this a feature, or did we strike upon unknown genius once again, and you're going to take credit? I am voting for the latter. <laughs> I'm I'm voting for the third as well. <laughs> because due to the fact that it's weapon attacks and not melee attacks, the if somebody if somebody wanted to be a drunken crossbowman, they could with this setup. Takes Kumpai is still up on the on the on the crow's nest. I heard no bell. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yes. I am now imagining full plated crossbow wielding monks that are all drunk off their asses. <laughs> oh. Stop moving, the two of you. Sir, there's only <laughs> one of them down there. I, are you sure? I see four. <laughs> it's it's kind of like the whole thing of... Yeah, fi fire, a, uh, fire a warning shot in their direction. Sir, this is a grenade launcher. Ah, eh, potato, potato. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, seventh level is t tipsy sway. Sip, hit. Miss, redirect, sip. When a creature misses you with a melee attack roll, you may spend a vitality as a reaction to redirect that attack towards one creature of your choice, other than the attacker, that you can see within the creature's melee reach. <sighs> you make a skill attack against the creature, targeting the same defense as the initial attack. The results of a hit or miss are the same for the initial attack. So the good, the good old drunken redirect, which... um. I'm not gonna. Obviously, I wouldn't use this with the crossbow monk, um, but I would use this with the spear monk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then we have at 14th level, quick sip. 
At the beginning of an, your encounter, before any creatures have acted, you may enter Gampai stance. Doing so does not count as a turn within the initiative order if initiative is being tracked. So you start out the fight drunk. Gotta love the logic of that. Oh shit, we're getting it. We're getting ambushed by goblins. Better get drunk. I mean, it's kind of your thing. You also get unorthodox strike. Your threat range with attacks increases by two. All attacks? I Skill guess. attacks? I M guess. <laughs> what? I'm going to crit that and redirect. <laughs> and if you're drunk and in drunken strike it falls in your new threat range and you and you and you critical the skill attack against the what i'm gonna make you the, the 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 thing you just missed me with i'm gonna make you critical hit your buddy right next to you instead oh that's okay So, Elixir of life for 18th level. Mm -hmm. The drink is understanding. It is meaning. At the bottom of the cup is life itself. That sounds like one of my mantras. And it's exactly the reason you're going to die of liver failure. <laughs> <laughs> you suffer none of the frailty of old age, and you can't be aged magically. You cannot die of old age. While intoxicated, you may expend a vitality in order to impose disadvantage on an attack as long as the target of the attack is within range of the weapon you are wielding. Doesn't require a reaction. So it's a free action. Mm -hmm. when, when threatened, you gain one vitality if you enter Kampe's stance and have no remaining vitality. Okay, I'm at zero vitality. Gumpe! I feel better now. <laughs> it really is the it really is the drunken immortal. I told you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I called it from the get go. Let's see. We and then we have Way of the Eternal Elements, I which is obviously going to be an answer to Way of Four Elements, i.e., the worst monk subclass in core. Um, the Way of the Eternal Elements is often thought to be the oldest among the classes. I want to change that to ways. In the primeval world, when humans first began to discover the power of the elements around them, they attuned to their power, utilizing them to defend themselves. So, first is Dance of the Resounding Elements. Earth, water, fire, lightning. The elements are fluid with one another, interchangeable. You, more than others, understand this. So you gain three spells from the following options. Earth, fire, earth, ice, lightning, and wind slash thunder. You are granted I know what I go for. To, you are granted access to three different stances. First stance is tranquility. When you assume this stance, you focus your elemental energy, gaining key. You gain an amount of key equal to your intuition modifier when you assume this stance and gain one additional key each time you hit an enemy with a weapon attack while in this stance. While in the stance, you gain one deflection for each key point you have exceeding your intuition modifier. You lose all unused key points if you do not enter dissonance on your next turn. And he put in a um, he put in an aside that I feel should be read. Features like these are why I have the ability requirements. For most classes, dump statting their class ability scores will make a class unplayable, and one of the design points of the game is to only present legitimate options to players. There will always be an extent of system mastery, of course, but the goal is to limit the bad options in favor of legitimate ones. Which is a good goal. Because mm -hmm. I, um, I've mentioned this in the past, but I do not care for this notion of, oh, you should, you should, you should play an intentionally gimped character so that you have role pl for more role playing opportunities. But why though? <laughs> why are those two things mutually exclusive? Yeah, like I said, but why though? So the next stance. All, the, all that it seems to do is piss everyone else off at the table. But so next is fluidity. When you assume this stance, you focus your elemental energy, gaining key. You gain an amount of key equal to your intuition modifier when you assume this stance, 
and one additional key each time you hit an enemy with a weapon attack while in the stance. You also gain five feet of movement for each key point you have exceeding your intuition modifier. You lose so, all unused key points if you do not enter dissonance on your next turn. So one of these is used for defense. The other is used for movement. Mm -hmm. And both are used to gain key. Yep. And in dissonance, while well, in this stance, you may, utilize your key, you may utilize your key and channel additional spell effects into your strikes. If you use a weapon to channel the spell, you may spend one key. You may spend one key in order to channel a secondary effect into your spell. In any given round, you may only spend an amount of key equal to half your level rounded up in secondary effects. You lose all unused key points at the start of your next turn. So this this style encourages mini novas all throughout the fucking battle. Pretty much. Dump, gather key on one stance, dump your key the next. Mm -hmm. And you can go tranquility to start gathering while defending, then fluidity to move into your target and still gather while... Or you lose all the other key and then get new key while moving. And then at dissonance, you can be like, okay, spell effect? Spell effect. I'm going to nuke you with a, with a, with a face-melting lightning bolt at point blank range with all these secondary effects in it boom it does oh, seem man. maybe i'm misreading it but it seems like it it seems like it it seems like this wants some um, this this want this wants you to be to be moving in and out between drink dissonance and one of the others yeah yeah um, so you you defend use something to push everybody away like maybe an earth spell with some modifiers and then you go fluidity to move up to the big target and use dissonance for something face melting and, and uber powerful as well. Mm -hmm. You just. It's all about mini novas and then changing depending on circumstance. Is, are you surrounded? Tranquility is probably your bet. Then dissonance to make it so that you're not surrounded anymore. Is there something you need to get to quickly? Go fluidity and fuck shit up. What the actual fuck? I love it. And, and while this encourages mini novas every other round, basically, it the by by the same uh, by the same feature, it actively prevents full like Boarding. taking over. Yeah, the full the full novas, mm -hmm. the one where you take over everything and it's no fun for anybody but you. Yes. The thing we have we've always tried to avoid. Mm -hmm. So at seventh level, you gain elemental resistance. You have, you gain resistance to fire, cold, lightning, and bludgeoning damage dealt by wind, thunder, and earth or earth and sources. If you already have resistance to one of these damage types, or gain resistance at a later point, you gain immunity to that damage type instead. And th then add um. At 14th level, you get improved stances. So tranquility, you gain damage reduction equal to your intuition modifier. Holy fuck. With fluidity, you can squeeze yourself through spaces at least one inch wide and gain resistance to all bludgeoning damage. Also, you may occupy the same square as other creatures, even if they're hostile. And for so, this... Go ahead. So that means... Since this is the 14th level feature and it comes after the 7th level feature, um, resistance to all bludgeoning damage. While you're in that stance, you become immune to bludgeoning damage dealt by wind, thunder, or earth, and sources, period. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> I just realized fluidity is, um, is Bio Rider. <laughs> Uh, yep. Um, let's see, dissonant and dissonance. While in this stance, your attacks deal an additional one point of damage for each remaining key point you have. So you, so, so um, you don't even have you. Know, so, so at fourteenth level, you don't have to blow it all on sp on spell casting if you don't want to. Yep, it's just that at the end of, at the end of your turn, you still lose all the key points, but you still deal. Additional damage for you. Oh my god. 
I've built up something like 14 key points. I'm just going to punch people until they die good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Damn it. So at, eight, at 18th level, you gain Elemental Mastery. As a quick act, as a ten foot quick action, you may expend a vitality and gain effects of all your stances simultaneously, stacking their identical effects. You may assume any of the stances or even activate this ability again on your next turn. Your max and your and your maximum vitality increases by an amount equal to your proficiency modifier. Wait, 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 wait! Stacking their identical effects. Yes. D does, so if I if I'm reading that correctly. You're already going to get amount of key equal to your intuition modifier twice and gain one additional key each time you hit an enemy with a weapon attack twice. Yep. If they're, if they're stacked like that, you already go double key. So you already have a key exceeding your intuition modifier by the amount of your intuition modifier. Which means you're going to get in deflection equal to your intuition modifier. Additional five feet of movement... Uh, per point of intuition modifier what the fuck that's one hell of a subclass capstone ain't it that's and then of course the maximum vitality increased by an amount equal to your proficiency modifier what the fuck <laughs> i could probably do a drinking game out of the number of times you've said what the fuck tonight Probably do a tricky game of <laughs> the amount of times I've said "what the fuck" through heavens and heresy thus far. No, I'm. I do not. I do not condone suicide. Hey, hey, now, hey. Straws It'd be the best. It, 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 who, 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 uh, who knows? Maybe they'll find the elixir of life instead. Fuck off, man. <laughs> <laughs> they'll they'll go down to zero vitality and then they'll take a drink and they'll be good again. <laughs> next is the next one that we have is way of the perfected soul. All things exist in balance: the body, the mind. One cannot exist without the other. A disciple trained in the way of the perfected soul balances all things and achieves martial perfection in the process. So the first one is enlightenment. If one wishes to improve the mind, one must train the body. And if one aims to improve the body, they must train the mind as well. Is that is that before or is that before or after you get you get tossed around by Izumi? <laughs> Bad. Bad monk. Nobody gets that reference but me. I held back from a Shao Tucker meme. I think I earned this. I mean, I don't think a show Tucker meme would actually fit here. What but he'd it? find some way to force it. Um, remember, remember shifting beasts? Remember what I said about him just now, saying he'd find a way to force it? <laughs> yep. And we're probably... we're pro For anyone thinking of putting us in the shame corner for, for referencing Shao Tucker, um, you can't shame people who have no shame. Anyway, what, as with the others, you gain you gain three different stances. The first one is Stunning Strike. While assuming this stance, you gain bonus damage to your attacks equal to intuition. And when you hit an attack, and when you hit with an attack against a creature, you may also inflict Stun One on it. Let me. S so stun I've got. So could you read off the stunned condition for me, please? Yeah, sure. Hold on. The stunned condition. If a creature is afflicted by the stunned condition, it must roll a d10 at the beginning of its turn. If it rolls a number above the severity, it may move and act normally. If it rolls a number equal to or below the severity of the condition afflicting it, it incurs the following effects and removes the severity of the stunned condition equal to its fortitude. It cannot move, utilize its action or reaction, and may only speak in faltering mumbles. Attacks which target the creature's strength or dexterity defense automatically hit, and other attacks against the creature are made with advantage. It's a, it's refresh. So we, 
We do have some degree of stun locking, but not in the, not in the same sense. Let's see, so next is perfected body. When you assume this stance, you gain a damage threshold equal to your intuition modifier plus your disciple level. The creature has immunity to all damage unless it takes an it, unless it takes an amount of damage equal to or greater than its damage threshold, in which case it takes damage as normal. Any damage that fails to meet or exceed the damage threshold is considered superficial and doesn't reduce the creature's hit points. So damage threshold instead this is the way DR used to be uh in D D. No, wait, hold on, I'm thinking something else. Resistance? Yeah. The fact that resistance and reduction are both written as DR is confusing. Yes. Yes. Let's see. So you have to exceed that number or you do no damage. Mm -hmm. That's then... that's actually pretty powerful level one. Or then int mod plus disciple level. Mm -hmm. If you've if you've made sure to keep your core in intuition modifier high, uh, that that's at, at even lowballing it. That's a three, and three damage is nothing to sneeze at. Bas you're basically not dealing with chips. Yeah. Let's see, and then perfected soul. While in this stance, you gain deflection equal to your int mod. Interesting. This um is surprise. This is a surprisingly tanky version of perfected soul. Mm -hmm. Let's see. At seventh level, you gain balance. Increase two of your non-core ability scores by two. You must choose both a physical and a mental ability. Ooh. Ooh. Hmm. If you're playing a Dexy Monk, you could increase your strength by two. Mm -hmm. Or does it count as a core ability score even if it's not technically the one that you're basing the class off of? We're going to need clarification on that. Yeah, I, I think I think that there should be a thing in the class section when it comes to when it comes to multiple ones. So for the for instance, the whole strength dexterity thing, whichever one you shoot, you have to pick at character creation whether strength or dexterity is a core is a um core ability score. Let me let me check this. Uh, actually, let me check let me check the the document for if it's already if it's already in there, then that's on me. Yeah, uh, let me check. Uh, picking your core abilities. When creating a character, you must pick three core abilities, which will define both the character's strengths and weaknesses. A player selects three abilities from the six abilities. You must pick at least one physical and one mental ability to be their character's core or defining abilities. Once a player chooses three core abilities, they place the highest scores from their ancestry ability score array into those abilities. Making sure the highest of those core abilities are placed according to the class which they wish to play. These abilities are defining for the character. They should be of the highest of those available. The chosen abilities determine not only what classes are available for a character, but also, importantly, which feats will be available to that character. Many feats require specific abilities to be core abilities in order to be chosen. So, it's only a core ability if you choose for it to be a core ability. Let's say you're playing a, a dex-based monk, or dex-based disciple, um, and so you chose dexterity, intuition, and let's say you wanted to throw some wits in there for, you know, tactics, setting up responses, etc. Mm -hmm. You'd also be able to get some feats based off that wits core ability. If, if, if you'd look at the feats and be like, maybe I want some of those wits feats. And so you choose wits. That means that strength at that point would not be a core ability because you didn't choose for it to be a core ability. And you could still increase it by two with this ability, with this feat. All right. All right. We really should have read the class introduction. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's our that's our bad. That's um, on us. We can't do that retroactively either. It would break the flow. So it, it, but this also explains why Tanner wanted us to go through feats first. Yeah. I um I still think I ended up making the right call in, in the end. Don't worry, we will get we will get to feats. It's just it's just going it's just going to take a bit it's just going to take a bit. Um, there there is one other thing I think does need to be talked about here because it was mentioned in some features earlier mm -hmm. about the dev note that we told him to keep about multiclassing. I'm going to read the multiclassing section as well. Mm -hmm. 
In Heavens and Heresies, you achieve the effects of different classes other than the one you chose at character creation by taking various feats and abilities that emulate those other classes rather than taking levels in the classes themselves. A character is only ever defined by one class. This is not to say that your options are in any way limited in Heavens and Heresies, only that the way one obtains the flavor they wish for their character is achieved in a different way. For example, rather than multiclassing between a paladin and vessel, one could take feats allowing their paladin use of certain magics. Alternatively, one could take martial feats as a vessel and thrive in the front lines. There are various ways to achieve different abilities within this system. Those methods are intended and balanced within the system, whereas multiclassing, taking levels in different classes, is not. This, the point of this is that you can achieve any flavor of character with the available race, feat, class, and subclass options, so in a sense, a player can multi-class, though they do so by picking different feats and features rather than taking levels in other classes. The system has been designed so that a frontline weapon-wielding wizard will be, will be balanced with the fighter at the side or the backline supporting paladin. Uh, magical items are another way that characters are able to gain features of another class. Though magical items are generally randomly rolled, they often have minor features directly from other classes, allowing players to achieve the flavor and effects of multi-classing without taking levels in two different classes. And then there's a dev note. While at first this tends to make people turn up their nose, in practice I've never seen anyone who was unable to play exactly want to, what they wanted to play in this system. The glasses of Heavens and Heresies are much more open than other games. You can play a frontline battle wizard from the get-go without needing to multi-class, and it's just as balanced as the more typical wizard. I, um, I, dis I distinctly remember a lot of people crying foul when the... Um when multi-classing was turned into feats for 4th edition. Um, and I had, I had argued, I'd argued that I was, per that I was perfectly fine with it because your, um, your feat slots are still, are still, are still fairly limited. So you are, you are taking some degree of a disadvantage by, mm -hmm. by doing this, but you're not go, you're not going through all the, um, all the all the roundabout route that you had to do the um, as we've talked about pay to not suck kind of thing because that's always been a problem with that with that notion of multi-classing into different um, levels where you end up you end up having to end up having to start at that at that second class from scratch and can't really do the ability integration and synergy that you want until several levels into it and um by that, by that, by the point that you do it, you um, you might be, you might just end up getting outclassed by your by your single class compatriots. Mm -hmm. There's another section after multiclassing that I also feel is important because the message here seems very important, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, it says classes and playstyles. More than anything, classes are representative of different playstyles rather than different roles in the more traditional sense. A wizard and a fighter are both equally able to fight in the front lines of combat, but the way in which they achieve that is very different. In the same way, an Inquisitor can be played as a paragon of martial prowess or as a stealth figure, hiding in the shadows and gaining information. What is more, these options should be balanced with one another. Heavens and Heresies seeks to reward players for the choices they make, rather than expecting them to fall into a certain pattern of play. Options which are equally available to the player should be equally viable. And then in the dev note, for the classes, one thing I'm considering is giving them some more ASI and uh, plus two to class ability score at four, another a two to class ability score at 12, and another two at a class ability at 19. But I'm waiting for a few more play tests before that. If I did do that, it would have some restrictor so that people didn't put all six into one stat, because that's kind of lame. I... This this game ethos is fantastic, and again, this reflects what we're doing with FF Legend projects mm -hmm. that that all things need to be equally viable and fun, so that nobody feels pigeonholed. Yeah, and granted, with FF Legend, there are um, there are some builds that that I had put in simply to be simply to be um, setting appropriate gags, like say the like say the merchant track. Yeah, but even then, that should be viable, and it will be. That's that's something that you can look forward to from us. Yeah. That the things that we're going to do with what we're doing and this is ours is much less baked than Tanner's work here. And Tanner's a one man band, so kudos. <laughs> uh what we're doing the, the I think the best way to say it is the ethos that we both have with game design in general is is 
everybody should be able to make the choices they want to make without severely impacting everyone else. Everyone should be having fun with the choices that they're making. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> move, now, moving right along, getting back on the rails, um, at 14th level, we have the improved stances. So, the perfected soul stances improve in the following ways. Stunning Strike inflicts an additional severity of stun when you strike an enemy. So, it's severity 2 instead of 1 for stun. I, it, so, is that each time you strike the enemy, though? Does it stack? That's what I want to know. We need some clarification there. I'm guessing that it doesn't, but yeah, that is that should be clarified. Um, perfected Body. When an ally within your melee reach would take damage while you're in this stance, you may expend a vitality or use your reaction to give them the benefits of your Perfected Body stance. You may choose to use this ability after knowing how much damage will be dealt. Oh. And this is at level 14, so your your level plus int mod is now much higher. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> at the very least, you're giving them damage reduction 16. Or damage threshold 16, as it's called here. Mm -hmm. um, which, while at 14th level, is still a smaller amount of damage. But, holy shit. Let's see. And Perfected Soul... When, it, when an ally within your melee reach would be hit by an attack while you are in this stance, you may either expend a vitality or you or use your reaction to give them the benefits of your perfected soul stance. This this sum um, is putting into context why at higher levels you could dole out you could um get more reactions. Yeah, so you can use your reaction to give people stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see, and... Now we know why the core abilities are the way they are! Yep. <laughs> they intertwine with your with your subclass abilities, and that is fantastic! Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> at 18th level, you gain Perfected Soul, and increase all of your ability scores by 2. What?! <laughs> what?! Um... I'm curious, if, I'm curious if there's the 20 cap on this kind of ASI. I I don't see it, so I'm guessing no. I don't I don't think that there is a, a cap to your ability scores. It's probably just whatever you can achieve with what features you've taken based off of the array you already get from your ancestry. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So next is Way of the Looming Shadow. People fear the night. They fear the darkness for what it might hide. Disciples trained in the ways of the looming shadow do not. The night, the darkness, is but a means to achieve one's goals. Protection from the notice of others. I am fear. I am the night. I am Batman! You know, you know somehow, somehow this doesn't annoy me as much as the way of shadow being a XP of a ninja did for core. I see. I see what you did. I see what you did there. Um, I had to. It was so, bugging me. <laughs> so, for, so um, first it. So first we have shadow arts. Once again, three. Once again, three stances. So the first is shadows bite. When you assume this stance, you gain bonus damage to your attacks equal to your intuition modifier. In addition, when you hit with a weapon attack against a creature, it becomes blinded one. So blinded uh, is it's good. It's blinded was part of hidden essentially. Um, for each severity of this condition affecting a creature, creatures which attempt to perceive or attack the creature increase the chance that they will automatically fail the roll by one from one to four to one to five on an attack roll or to one uh, for an ability check, for example. Mm -hmm. So it increases their fail range. By one. All right. Well, by one per severity of the condition. Imagine if you could inflict blinded ten. Don't give him Ooh. ideas. I mean, there's probably a way to do it. I, I imagine a flashbang grenade would. Yep. So you, so you want to literally blind them by the light. Blinded by the light. 
So <laughs> next is Dance of Life and Death. When you hit a threatening creature with a weapon attack while in this stance, you may have your attack deal physical or poison damage rather than its normal damage and gain a number of hit points equal to your intuition modifier as a result. Life leech and affliction damage? Or at least physical or poison damage. Mm -hmm. Wow! Wow! Imagine pairing up this guy with the with the uh, with the the way or the way of sh of shifting beasts. Let's see. Ne next is shadow step. Well, in this stance, you gain the ability to step from one shadow into another. When you have when you have severity of the hidden condition caused by darkness, rather than moving, you can teleport up to your movement speed to an unoccupied space that you can see that is also affected by the hidden condition caused by darkness. The amount, of, the total amount of space you teleport is subtracted from your movement. It's, it, it, the name is literal, Shadow Step. Mm -hmm. If I'm in one shadow and I can see another shadow within my movement range, I can just go to that shadow. That's literally what that is. Let's see, you also gain Dark Vision. If non-magical darkness would render something as hidden from you, you may ignore, ignore up to four severity of that condition. If you already have dark vision from another feature, you may ignore up to six severity rather than four. Why do I feel that the way of the looming shadow was created by dwarves? Dwarven ninjas. There's a horrifying thought. Horrifying? It's it's common. What are you talking about? There's dwarven ninjas everywhere, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am ten ninjas that you can't see. <laughs> so seventh at seventh level you gain the long death when you are reduced to zero hit points you may expend one vitality no action required to be reduced to one hit point instead if you have enough vitality you can give yourself one hit point for a while yeah Let's see, then at 14th level you gain improved stances. Oh. Hindered one? What? Yep. Shadow's Bite, when you strike a creature, it becomes hindered one. Let's... I think we, I think we need to see hindered. Each of a creature's movement types are reduced by five feet for each severity of the hindered condition afflicting it. If a creature is rendered unable to move with its movement while afflicted by the hindered condition, weapon attack rolls against the creature have advantage. The creature's weapon attack rolls have disadvantage, and attacks which target the creature's dexterity defense have to have advantage. Wait, does this mean if you have double advantage if you're a dexterity-based monk using unarmed weapon strikes? Since it would be based in your dex as your combat uh, uh, core ability? And remember, this is the one where if they use their dash action, it can overcome the hindered condition. Mm -hmm. If the hindered condition would make it unable to move. Yep. Yeah, so... So now not only have you blinded them one, you've hindered them one. They have disadvantage to hit you anyway. And... Imagine if your hindered one took them to a point where they couldn't move. Does that give them double attack disadvantage? What does double disadvantage even do? Is there such a thing? I want to know. I need I'm, to know. One part of me wants to know. The other part is terrified at the prospect. I want to know. Please, Tanner, give me enlightenment. <laughs> and the um, next we have um, Dance of Life and in, with Dance of Life and Death. Your weapon attacks deal additional damage equal to your intuition modifier. And remember that could, that it, that counts as poison damage that leeches. Or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. And Shadow Step, when you teleport using your Shadow Step ability, you then have advantage on the first weapon attack you make before the end of your turn. In other words, surprise, motherfucker. Surprise, motherfucker. <laughs> there you go. My best imitation uh, of Coat. And the capstone at 18th level is Cloak of Shadows. If you would be hidden by darkness, you may double the severity of the hidden condition granted to you by that darkness. 
In addition, all darkness is considered magical darkness for the purposes of concealing you. You are always considered to be hidden by an amount equal to your intuition modifier. This does not count as being hidden by darkness. You are always invisible. <laughs> I, I I want to read the next one. I, I'm, I'm looking at it and I want I want to read it. <laughs> Can I read it, Mark, please? Before, the, before that, let me just reflect. Let me just reflect on the absurdity at 18th level here. I'm always hidden, and then if I hide in in darkness, I I can double the hidden condition granted by the dark. Magical, it's magical darkness. Only where I am, though. Fuck you for anybody else. This Two. Also, this also this also means that you can that um you have an easy escape when it comes to using shadow step. Because it's magical darkness, yeah. Is no matter where you, no matter where you are, you're still you're still in shadow, so you can jump to another shadow you can see. As long as it's with, it, as long as you have enough movement for it. Yeah, it's just that. Uh, remember, if you're in, if you're not standing in a shadow, you're you're hidden. That's equal to your int mod is not being hidden by, by darkness, so it's yeah. not shadow stepping from bright light. But then, then we have the. I want <laughs> to. I. This is the way of the entering fist. The description of this subclass. I made this class wrong as a joke. <laughs> I understood that reference. So did I. So this archetype won't oh, won't appear in the published game, but it's probably the best one I've ever written. Okay, let's see what we've got. First yeah. Level is otherworldly training. If you if they have an ass, you'll kick it. Let's see, you're granted three different stances. First is face to foot style. When a creature when when a creature would deal damage to you while in this stance, you may use your reaction to cause both yourself and the creature to take damage equal to your intuition modifier. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is that fetal or fit though it is fetal defense. <laughs> While prone, you gain damage reduction equal to your intuition modifier, and enemies do not have advantage on melee attacks against you. It's curling up on the ground in a ball. And special step. When you assume this stance, you have disadvantage on ability skull skullduggery checks to avoid being heard, but allies within five feet of you have advantage <laughs> on ability skullduggery checks to avoid being heard. Third level feature, point. Reaching out, you are granted a brief insight into the target's defenses. As an action, you may extend your hand and point a finger at a target within 30 feet of you. On your next turn, you gain advantage on your first attack roll against the target, provided that you do not take damage before them. If you take damage, you may make a constitution check equal to 10 or half the damage taken, whichever is higher, or lose the benefits of the feature. And the note on this feature... Uh, is someone asks, isn't this just the true strike spell from 5e? The response from Tanner, smiley emoji. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love it! Um, let's see, then seventh level it is blood makes the victor. Only those who are bleeding can ever truly be victorious. Whenever you lose vitality as a result of being unconscious, creatures within 100 feet of you have disadvantage on, the, on their next roll. <laughs> You're unconscious and bleeding, but they have disadvantage. Every creature. This includes your allies. What the hell? <laughs> the 11th, 11th level. I'm a man too, you know. I go pee pee standing up. That's the, that's the description of this of this feature, by the way. I go pee pee standing up is the flavor text. You may choose to roll an ability persuasion check with disadvantage in order to give yourself a plus one bonus to the roll. What? Hold on, hold on. Let me let me let me say this meme correctly. What? What the fuck? <laughs> Weird flex, but okay. At 14th level, you gain improved, quote-unquote, stances. You your, want to be the chosen one! Your, sta your stances improve in the, fo in the following ways. 
Face to foot style. When you when you use your reaction and cause both yourself and the and the attacking creature to take damage, you may increase that damage by an amount equal to your level at fourteenth level. Fetal defense. When you take damage while in this stance, you may expend your reaction in order to fall prone. Since falling prone is what gives you all the special stuff in the de in the defense in the first place. Is... There's a note from one of <laughs> There's a note here from one of the playtesters. But falling prone is a quick action five feet. Starting to think you don't take this subclass seriously. Um, I don't think this person got the joke. Either either that or they're just rolling with it. Might be. But um, this actually this actually is an improvement over falling prone as a quick action five feet, because it's using your reaction instead mm -hmm. when taking damage. Uh, if you call having to take damage to activate something as an improvement. Jury's out on that. Read that special... I, and special okay, step. If you go, move go. more than 20 feet in one continuous movement while in this stance, make a skill attack on each creature within 100 feet of you targeting their intuition. On a hit, you distract enemies within 100 feet of you by an amount equal to your intuition modifier. Now, hold on. You said a skill attack on each creature, mm -hmm. but then distract enemies. Do you mean to put creatures there so it's even funnier and you're still distracting your allies too? Just like you do with the other stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I uh, I also like that the that the guy who pointed out the true true strike spell also says, "I think this is coming too close to being good. Might need a nerf." Winking emoji. <laughs> and the eight and eighteenth level is united. We fall. If you are going to fall, you are going to bring other with you. Mm -hmm. If an attack were to hit you. And creatures within 60 feet are affected by the same attack. They are also hit by the they're also hit by the attack, regardless of their defense. So if you're being cleaved by a dragon and the attack hits you, everybody else near you gets hit too. <laughs> this is a joke subclass, and I'm here for it. I'm sorry. Are you absolutely sure you shouldn't put this in as a as a as a add-on on your site, Tanner. <laughs> like this, this rem this remind. Do you remember when uh, Magic: The Gathering would have the would have those unsets? Yes, I have unhinged and unglued cards still, some and of, unstable. I have a bunch of, them, of unstable some cards. Of be, some of some of them being just an excuse to see how many times they could put ass in a card in card text. Yes, I know. That's what this feels like, and that's. And or or some of the ridiculous April Fool's jokes that White Wolf would do back in the day. <laughs> and I I love this subclass. I love this subclass. <laughs> I would never let anybody fucking run it unless we were running a Kung Pao campaign because that's what this is. <laughs> yeah, this is basically Kung Pao or uh or or. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I just realized one other thing. One of the weapon specializations you can take is Axe Mastery. <laughs> Anyone feel like doing the happy dance? <laughs> uh... <laughs> uh... <laughs> I love... I love this last subclass just for how fucking hilarious it is. That's why. That's why I'm saying we can't. We can't let this. Um, we can't let the. We can't let this one. Um, just disappear when the game goes gold. This has to be on the website or something like that, or put put it or put it back up as an April Fool's joke or something. Give it its own page in the book, with a completely different look from a different like themed, uh, core rulebook, of some sort. So everybody is confused as to why this one page has, or well, this is probably going to be more like one section considering how big it is, mm -hmm. but why this one section suddenly looks like it's from a completely different book. It would add to the joke with a visual gag as well, and I am here for it. Please, Tanner, please. <laughs> please. Yes. I beg of you. 
but with the, with that said, this was our I'd say this was our this was our first intuition based um, class that we've looked at, and I um you know how you know how earlier I meant I mentioned that whole one size fits all approach with the with the monk. This is not that. This is the opposite of that. The we've got stuff like stance dancing. We've got C. We've got CC. We've got we've got um we've got the we've got the tank we've got the tanky monk for those who for those who want to go that way. We've um, got the goddamn Batman. Yeah. And we all, maybe and that's we how also... Batman gets away from Commissioner Gordon all the time without him ever seeing him leave. It's this shadow step stance. He does that. <laughs> exactly. But. Th but then we, ha there's the f I can un I um now I was at first curious why you were getting subclasses right out of the gate, but now that I've seen how the subclasses work, it makes sense. Um. I this is ca this is ca a lot. What I what I find in what I find interesting with this compared to the class subclass relationship in say five e mm. is the class features for a lot of classes in core are fairly vanilla and where the yeah. interesting part is going to be the subclass but most of the time that subclass feels very divorced from the um, core abilities. That's not the case here. There is an intrinsic synergy. Especially with all the extra fucking reactions. First we were thinking four extra reactions and you can share them? What the hell? Mm -hmm. And then we saw there are so many reaction-based things in this. Uh... Hey, wait! You have four reaction. You have uh, at least three react. Uh, three total uh, extra reactions uh, from a at fourteenth level. That means you could fall prone and still do other things. <laughs> <laughs> With way of the answering fist. Are you in? T like, like I said, I don't. I know you. I know it was a joke, but I do understand why you consider that your best subclass, at least so far. But we can't. But don't um. Don't let that thing be forgotten, please. I'm telling you, if you make a print book. That has a specific style to all of the pages. You make that section alone a completely different style from the rest of the book to add to the gag. Although one th one thing that I can't one one thing I can't help but notice that wasn't in here. There is there is no mention of any of any equivalent of um of flurry of blows. might not be necessary might not even be thematically uh, might it not might not even be suited to the way the encounter system works probably probably not especially especially since some um, for all intents and purposes flurry of blows is still um is 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 just is just attacking more than once around which you can do with an extra action mm hmm and with some of the stances, which you can do with an extra reaction. I'm, I'm. What I'm reminded of is when, when I, when I was, when, when the, um, when the, um, when the design articles between third and fourth edition L5R were brought up. One of the things that they mentioned that they were cha that they were changing was ha was for a lot of the um, Bushi schools at mm -hmm. the at the higher tiers in third edition. They had it where you could t where you could take one attack action for free. Mm. In fourth edition, this was changed to attack. Normally, attacks normally attacks are a full action, whereas at a certain tier with um with Bushi schools, um as long as long as you met the right right criteria, it would be a half action. So you yeah. Can, you, so you um, so you could use that other action to do other things. They had said that they wanted to in, they wanted to go with more variety, especially since, especially since um, go going it going in with going in with a lot of attacks is not a get is not exactly going to be advisable in a game like L five R. Um, 
and because of because of that, the set the um, setup that you have the setup that you have in you have a similar thing in this case. So once you have that extra action at that threshold, you could use that to emulate flurry of blows. And I mean, is it really of a flurry if there's only two blows? It's about the it's about the same as the amount it's about the same as the flurry and and core. True. And truth be truth be told, when it came to when it came to flurry of blows before that, yeah, you were getting a bunch of attacks, but you were getting more and more sucky as you as you did them. Yeah, it was better just to use your, your bab back in third. And use your key for other things. Nah. Well, there was also the fact that they decided to have key. They in third they decided to have key be magic, but not quite. Yeah. Um. Magic, but it sucked. But in the but in the case uh in the case here. Though those multiple attacks actually actually synergize, because if you if you recall for things like way of the eternal elements. You're getting your every time you hit every time you hit you get key. Yep. So you it all get, weaves in. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think that now that I did do a reading of those sections in the uh, in the class introduction, I understand even better about uh, how you're going to achieve even more varied character types and effects using feats to effectively emulate parts of other classes on top of whatever class you want to play. So not only are the core mechanics, so looking at what we've looked at so far, Barbarian and Disciple, the core mechanics of Barbarian are all about being tenacious and they stand on their own merit. And then the subclasses weave in flavors of tenacity and different ways to achieve them. Whereas the monk is a little bit opposite. The core, the core class abilities are supplements and, synerg and synergize with whatever school of, of disciplehood you're going to be. Whether you're going to be Sun Wukong or Mr. Uh, Foot-to-Face style, <clears throat> uh, you're going to choose your flavor first. And then you're going to get that flavor bolstered and supported from the from the core class components. Those already give you a high level of customizability. Adding on the fact that you can now go, well, what other, what is the third core uh, core ability modifier or core ability I want to choose to have? Let's go look at the feet section. Oh, these feet sound cool. They kind of make me a little tanky. Or wow, that feet sounds great. I could I could get so many crits out of that one. And then you choose your third core ability modifier based on that because of the uh, prerequisites for feats. And you start adding in these other pieces from potentially outside a, a, a other class-like features for an even higher example of character customizability. I like this. I love this. Customizability is... <sighs> Everybody out there who watches this, you're likely a gamer in some respect. Customizability that matters is the spice of life, and you all know it. <laughs> yeah, which is... Which is... Oh, which is... Which is why I've, um... I've, I've, poked, I've, poked, fun, I've poked fun at the um, simplicity defense when it comes to core. That's not to say I'm opposed to to get to game mechanics being simple, but I don't I mean, like hell. it as a um, defense. I mean, hell, uh, what we're doing with FF Legend has a lot of simplification on it. We've simplified a lot of things. Yeah, exactly. but for us, for us, it's for, in both cases, it's less of simplification and more of trimming the trimming the fat to away from. Um, what's going what's going to be useless and, and yep and also uh, um you know flair for the type of thing we're achieving 
Uh, and it's clear that Tanner's doing the same with Heavens and Heresies. Mm-hmm. Very clear. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I, I, I can't help but compare it to FF Legend at this point because we have a we, we basically have the same design ethos of make everything viable so it's always fun. Mm-hmm. Just even, we're even doing if the, even if the fun gets a little bit um, ridiculous, campy, <laughs> hammy. Are we all going to chew on the scenery? Probably. Chewing on the scenery is half the fun. Come on now, guys. Mm-hmm. You see oh. how I act when we're doing all this? Yeah. You think I'm any different than when we're not in person? <sighs> I always, I always find it, I always find it cute when there's the whole adage of, of your, of, of the whole, oh you, oh you're, on, you're only acting that way because you're online. Nope. This is we, Zan and I, Zan and I act the exact same way, no matter, no matter whether we're, whether we're online or off. I can attest to this for Monk. Monk can attest to this for me, and some fine, lovely people we met at Cowtown can attest to this for both of us. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> We are who we are. You have us here now. Uh, we don't care if you don't like us. <laughs> we just, but we just, if you don't like us, we just keep. We'll just keep. We don't care because we just keep laughing at you. Mm-hmm. Oh. And so, with with all of that in mind, uh, I, monk, I want to do more, but I gotta wait till next week. Well, Not there. Um... Next week, next week, we're going to be tackling our first casting class. Because <laughs> next next week, have you solved the mystery of the druids? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> druids. Gotta find the druids through the magic of the druids. <laughs> I have I have high hopes. Um, I'm sure we'll see flavors that are staples of the druid class, though iterated in an entirely different fashion than what I we've seen before. I don't think we're going to be getting Godzilla next week, unless it, unless you manage to turn into a fifty story fish. But that's a different story. But yeah. <sighs> But I, I do I do imagine that one of the subclasses is probably going to be something with animal friends or turning into animals, as that is just a druid trope at this point. But like I said, I very much doubt we're going to see it like we do in core. It's going to be iterated way differently. Oh, oh yeah. Um, as for as for the way that I have to feel, since the monk is a, a grab bag of different flavors, um, I'm gonna. I'm going to do my, my flavor assessment like I did with Barbarian, except this time I have to do it in reverse because Barbarian had a very distinct core ideal with flavors. This The flavors are the core ideals. So, starting at the way of the laughing monkey. We've already said it, everybody. This is Sun Wukong in all but name. Um, I mean, you don't have his fire powers, but that's it's hardly, hardly, uh, hardly the uh, the primary thing he's known for. The primary thing he's known for is being tricky, um, being able to teleport in a single fucking somersault. I can go tw- one hundred twenty thousand li in a single somersault. A li being half a kilometer, so um, and making doppelgangers. So the, the whole making doppelgangers and teleporting around, yeah, that's all Sun Wukong. Uh, Way of the Shifting Beasts. Um, we made our avatar, our our, our, uh, our Full Metal Alchemist jokes, but I would, uh, I, and I made my Shaolin Kung Fu jokes. Mm-hmm. Um, if I need to use something more contemporary, um, Lei Wu Long. Yeah, Lei Wu Long would work. Um, I still think at most this is your typical Shaolin monk. This is this feels like somebody going for I want to be the Shaolin monk from the from the one Chinese wuxia movie I saw such a long time ago. That's what this feels like to me. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> uh drunken brawler we all like 
there there's nothing more we already said the, the one of the eight Dallas immortals that the drunken immortal mm-hmm. um way of the eternal elements the joke i didn't get to make because we we went pretty quickly on to a uh, way of the perfected soul was only the avatar master of the four elements because of the elemental mastery uh, capstone mm-hmm. um way of the perfected soul uh is very much Buddhist fighting monks. You synergize heart, body, and spirit in order to, uh, in order to perfect yourself. And in the event that you need to fight, well, you fight in that synergistic way. I was way of the looming. Either, I was going to go with either that or um, Royal Guard style. Royal Guard. Okay, <laughs> got it. Um. Way of the Batman, I mean Looming Shadow. Mm-hmm. It's Batman. It's fucking Batman. At the very, and then at if... the very least, this is this is go this is going. All, I think the reason why La- why Looming Shadow didn't annoy me is that it's going all in on the shadow manipulation thing instead of trying to be a not instead of trying to be a not ninja. Yeah. And then, even though it's a joke class, even though uh, it probably won't be in base. Way of the Entering Fist, we already said it, Kung Pao. Mm. I mean, it's in the name of the fucking class. It's either Kung Pao or... I was going to say it's Kung Fu Hustle, but no, not re- not really. Well, it says Way of the Entering Fist. Kung Pao, enter the fist. Yeah. Um, although this although um, this, does, this does mean one thing. We inevitably have to bully Tanner into including Gopher Chucks. Ha <laughs> ha! I don't think it'll be bullying. I think he'll be happily on board. <laughs> but those are my those are my interests and in the flavors of of disciple. Mm-hmm. Um, next week we'll see whether Druid has a single core class conceit that it builds flavors on top of, or if, like the disciple, the flavors are the core conceit and the and the non archetypal or the non subclass. Uh, um features are there to synergize with the subclass. Yep. Something else I do think we should point out that was that was brought up with um with Way of the Eternal Elements is that mm-hmm. we're not dealing is that once as we hinted at before and we'll probably delve into a lot more when we get to the actual spellcasting system, we're not dealing with um with a spell list in that in the same way. That was that was one of the major problems with um with the way of the four elements monk yeah and and uh much like what we saw when we when we did the initial core mechanics overview in our first episode um with the small examples of how spell casting may work mm-hmm. um it's more about having mastery of a specific for lack of a better term um attrib- attributed type of spell like in in the way of the uh, of the eternal elements, it's you get to choose three different elements mm-hmm. out of out of the uh, five that are there. Um, and then when we saw it in the core mechanics, uh, you basically get f- like five for fire, which was the example there. It gets little packets of modifiers mm-hmm. that you can add on to it. Um, it, in that respect, it almost reminds me of Bravely Second's Wizard class, uh, where you combined a modifier with an element to make a specific uh, spell. Because they all got spirit magic, which gave them elements, and then they got spellcraft, which then gave those elements specific um, factors. And that's what this feels like to me, almost how this spell system might work. And to a to a distant degree, the um, the spell casting setup in Final Fantasy Type Zero. To a distant degree, yes. Uh, but that but that's going to do it for this episode of Heavens and Heresies. You have no idea how tempted I am to make this a twofer, but we can't. <laughs> 
I want to. I want to, but I have to wait until next Friday. <sighs> but there, but there's still going to be plenty of um, craziness in the in the coming days, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.